Marrakesh will be giving us this talk um, and there will be time for questions at the end. So hold on to them. Thank you very much. Uh, we are delivering this talk together uh, with Stefan. So we just thought that instead of having two standard talks that we give, why don't do something special this year? Why don't bring you some fresh material? So we tried our best to give you some new use cases, new examples of the tools that you might already heard of many times. So we are really happy to present you today uh, how can we use uh, AsyncIO and Cyton together to make uh, more efficient software. So uh, let's start. We will just um, begin with the introduction because we see people are still coming. So, uh, Stefan, yeah, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, so, uh, hi everyone, I'm uh, Stefan Bene, uh, one of the, the core developers of Cython, uh, also known from, from the AlexML project. Uh, I've been a Python developer since 2002. Uh, kind of an active member of the Python community, uh, especially the, the one in, in Deutschland, um, Germany. Uh, yeah, and I'm working for Scooby together with uh, Anton. Yeah, uh, so uh, I'm Anton, you see, I'm also a Python developer, that's my main job. Uh, I'm also organizing PyCon DE, so I'm using this as another chance to remind everyone that yes, it does exist this year, it's in October, so go on pycon.de and see and come. We are so happy to have everyone there. And let me give a credit to the cool company where we're working on right now. So. Uh, Scooby is an ebook flatrate, ebook subscription service that operates for quite a while. It has uh, a coolest deal in Germany and it's available not only in Germany but worldwide. We have a lot of books. Uh, we have a decent uh, price of 9.99 per month and people love it because they put five star ratings to it. That's of course uh, advertising. But what is even more relevant today is that the stuff that we are showing you today is used in Scooby at least partially. So we are Python-based uh, backends. We are developing it from day to day on daily basis. And so the stuff that we are presenting you is tested in production. So, yes. Let's start. About this talk, how will it be structured? So uh, we start with the introduction to AsyncIO just to have everyone on the same track. What, uh, what is it about and uh, what will be the examples about today? Uh, then we will go uh, to Cython topic and have a brief examples of uh, what is it about and how it does work. Uh, then we will show you how to use that together and how you can benefit from that. From that uh, and we'll show you some practical examples. Easy ones, more, more complicated ones. And then of course we'll have cool questions from you. I hope so. Good. So first, uh, AsyncIO. Who of you guys used AsyncIO? I think that, yeah, we do not need to stop too much on that because it's such a buzzy topic, you know. It's represented very great on this conference, so I think we just have to go very briefly about it so everyone is on the same track. So I think, uh, yo, it's finally, finally a default tool in Python starting from 3.4 but backported to 3.3 uh, that we can use for the asynchronous network communication. It gives us tools uh, that have been already available in different libraries. It was there forever in Twisted, it was there in Tornado. Uh, and there and there was Async Core as well. But Async is sort of a common tool to do this sort of work. I'll just uh, switch to another notebook quickly to show you some graphics. background. Uh, just a very, very brief recap. Why do we need this tool today? Why are we speaking about it? So uh, let's take a simple case of a synchronous processing of some request. So requests are on the left, processing, so our backend is in the middle, responses are on the right. This is a time scale, so time is going down. This is a traditional stuff that everyone was taught in the universities. So we get a request, we are processing it, we throw the response out, then we get the next request, 
we process it, we throw the response out, synchronous, standard, and simple. More realistic cases, though, that we have more than one request coming during the processing of the, of the first one, and they just have to wait. We receive three requests, but we can do just one task at a time, so we do it. We throw responses as we are completing our tasks, time is going, the same thing. Then uh, the deal about this thing is that uh, most of the time, uh, at least in the IO bound applications, like uh, most of the websites, most of the web services, most of the database uh, applications are just idling, waiting for IO. So this time is something that our CPUs are wasting and we could save that if we could do other stuff in the meanwhile while we are waiting on the blocking resource. So I marked here this box as waiting, let's say the database, some other external API, whatever. And the uh, asynchronous execution model lets us to save this time by uh, switching between tasks. So we have same three tasks, task one, task two, and task three. But in this scenario, we work on task one, then we do blocking request to the database, and we can work on the other things in the meanwhile. So we jump to the task two right away. When task two is done, it's a short one, then we go back to task one because we got a reply from the database and we work on that and so on. So we jump between tasks. That's how we can uh, cut the uh, idling and waiting on the IO. Uh, and that's how we basically, in most of the internet related applications can uh, save on the total execution time of some tasks. So what is the deal about I think IO uh, with this? Is uh, first of all, it's an event loop known as Reactor from Twisted, like 12 years ago was already there. Uh, so again, it's nothing new, it's just a standard way to do that. What IO loop does is essentially it's, uh, um, uh, it's a tool that uh, is managing the network events and it knows which event is related to which code in our application. So it will be remembering uh, when data available on particular socket, which piece of code should it call. And then when the piece of code uh, gives the control back to the IO loop, then it decides also which piece of code should be executed next. So it does this jumping between blocks of code and it does the callbacks. Then, another thing, it finally gives us a common future class. It's the uh, same interface basically, almost same interface as concurrent futures that we had before. It's also pretty similar to tornado futures that we had and there are libraries that can convert one future into another. So you can mix the frameworks. Uh, and what is a future, just a quick reminder, it's uh, so it's called deferred and twisted, a placeholder for some uh, result of a probably network operation that is not available yet, but will be available soon. We're using it as a link to the future result of some operation to uh, not block and wait, but to do other things meanwhile. And finally, uh, coroutines. Again, it's quite similar to coroutines that we had in Tornado, but uh, not only the uh, coroutine mechani mechanics itself is updated, but also the declaration of coroutine is updated uh, starting from 3.5. So we can use async await, oops, async await syntax instead of yield from syntax. That is sort of fancier way to do that. And uh, Cyton supports it. We'll have a deeper review of that. How can we use that together soon? Let me just quickly finish with a think of your introduction first. Yes, uh, so coroutines, as I said, is uh, based on the generators, can be um, declared with the yield from syntax or with async def syntax. It's uh, a function or a generator that can be suspended and uh, give the control to other coroutines in the meanwhile. A very simple example that I show you just to get started is uh, we use a new fancy async dev syntax. We do some processing, then we want to do the blocking operations. So we use async HTTP uh, client to fetch something for us. Fetching is a blocking operation. So async HTTP client will, will return us a future, not the real result, so we don't wait. Then we use await syntax or yield from syntax to uh, point the IO loop that, okay, this is something that we don't want to wait, give control to other coroutines and uh, just uh, resume this coroutine at this place when the result is ready on the socket. And then when we have it, we do more processing and return the result. Easy.
So uh, finally, we are getting closer to the uh, to the thing that we will be showing you today about uh, how can we go even further in optimizing uh, our async I/O task. So on this graph, what we are showing you is some front-end server that we have. Uh, front-end, let, let's say it's just some uh, piece of the software that accepts uh, network connections. And uh, it gives uh, the tasks to backend part that is doing some background processing for us. AsyncIO is running here on the front server. It's getting request number one. It does some processing. And then, OK, we need uh, some data from the backend. So we do request to backend. Backend does some processing. Meanwhile, we have request two that is going to the front end server. It is started. It is executed. And then AsyncIO gives control again to the request number one because this result is already available here. What we see here is that even though request one has begun before request two, it will only get response afterward. So it was waiting longer than it could be waiting because uh, the result from the backend that we need is already available here at this point. But because there was request two coming in in the meanwhile and we have just one thread in which we execute everything, we had to delay the processing of the request one even further. It can get even worse if we have a request three. So AsyncIO decides uh, which task should be done next. And if at this point it decides, okay, we have uh, the request number three and we have data available from the backend here, which one should we do next? It could decide, okay, let's work on the request three and then request one is delayed even further. So even though coming in first, it will be served last. And um, this in some applications can be quite critical because we are not fair in the way we are dealing uh, client requests here. And the most straightforward thing, obviously, what we can do is to make these times shorter. So the shorter are uh, the times that we need for processing some data, the faster we can uh, give responses and also uh, the more flexible we are in switching between the tasks that we are currently executing. So in this case, by uh, shorting the processing time on the async IO side twice, we see that even, even though the backend could take the same time to give those data that we need, even though we still are way better in uh, serving the front-end request because uh, we are more efficient in switching between them, and so our responses will be available faster. And as you probably already guessed, uh, how can we reduce the latency? How can we, uh, how can we process uh, async your tasks more efficiently? It's only, only if we uh, reduce uh, the task, the time it takes to process every piece of the code that is there on async your side. It's not database because database is probably the blocking response that will be processed in some other place. It is some usually Python code that is taking time to be executed. And here the Cyton comes in. Now let uh, Stefan give you introduction about Cyton and then we talk about how can we optimize a sync your task with that. Okay. Um, so I'll just quickly give you a review of what Cyton is and then uh, give you a 10 minutes intro to Cyton as a compiler and as a language. Uh, well, Cyton is a compiler. It's actually the most widely used static Python compiler out there. Uh, it's been so the early days of Cython, when it was still called Pyrex, uh, were back in 2000. Uh, and the Cython project itself started in 2007, so it's actually it, a very old piece of code. Um, it's, uh, nowadays, it's, it's a major part of the scientific Python ecosystem, so um, people are writing tools with it uh, that allow you to do lots of number crunching. Um, NumPy has Cython codes in it, the code in it, uh, Pandas, for example. Many, many well-known tools and data crunching tools are written in Cython. Um, and what it gives you is it uh, takes a piece of Python code or also a piece of uh, Cython code with, which has an extended syntax um, and outputs C code from it. So it generates C code, uh, which is compilable um, uh, and uses the C Python C API. So um, you get an extension module, which you can import. 
uh, and then you just use uh, any other module in Python. As I said, it extends the Python language whenever you want to do optimization, uh, optimize your code, uh, and interact with external C code, external C++ code. It gives you that entirely for free because, you know, it compiles down to C, so talking to C code is native. Um, and uh, that's one of the cool features. It's open source, you can find it on site.org. Uh, we are on GitHub, so if you have any cool ideas um, what we can do better, uh, just talk to us there. Okay, so site on in 10 minutes. Um, okay, so I can see it all, that's cool. Um, here's an IPython notebook, or Jupyter notebook, uh, however you want to call it. Uh, the first thing you would do is uh, you would say load xcython. That uh, adds the Cython magic to the IPython notebook um, and allows it to execute Cython code directly. So it's a very interactive way to, uh, to getting compiled code into your uh, IPython notebook. What am I using here? So I'm using Python 3.5 and the latest Cython release, which I released a couple of days ago, uh, just for the conference. So uh, you're the early adopters here. Um, and uh, then what you can do is you can take an IPython cell and say, um, this is compiled Python code, okay? Um, actually, what I'm doing up to here is, um, this is, is just plain Python, and I could just use uh, plain Python code and say, please compile it for me. Um, but here I'm already using uh, the extended Cython syntax for, as I said, for optimization, for using C data types in Python code, um, which Cython allows me to do. Uh, so what's this doing? I have a little function add one, which is, you know, takes a value, adds one to it. Uh, I do the same uh, with two values, so I'm adding two values, um, x and y, and here uh, is already uh, part of the extended syntax that you can see. It allows me to, allows me to declare uh, the, uh, to declare C data types, use C data types for my variables, and uh, then what Cython will do is it's going to optimize uh, the code for me. Okay, so it sees this variable is actually a C integer, so I can use native C operations on it, and that's as fast as your processor goes, uh, as opposed to as fast as Python can deal with objects, which is way faster. Okay, um, so this is how the syntax looks like. I can declare uh, argument types. I can declare variables with this C def statement. So I'm, I have, an, I have a, a global variable A here which is also just a C int, and then I'm using it in my function here, adding it uh, uh, to variable x, and since both x and a are C integers, the add operation will be run uh, by a simple uh, processor, the CPU add operation. So that's, um, you know, the add into C and can be done um, directly in C. Um, okay. The nice thing is you don't have to care about these things, right? You, you just declare your variables, and Cython will generate efficient C code for you, which do usually does the right thing. Okay. Um, there's a way for, uh, for um, helping you understand what Cython makes of your code. Uh, I'm not just saying you're Cython, this is Cython cell, I'm saying Cython minus A, which means annotate, take my code and annotate it for me, tell me what you think about it. And this is what Cython gives me. Uh, it outputs a little piece of HTML and tells me, okay, this is what I've seen in your code, and when I click on it, um, this is what I'm doing here, so there are a couple of operations, and here I'm seeing x is an object variable, uh, so the, um, the operation it does here is actually an, uh, an, um, an opera a Python object operation, and down here, uh, as I said, um, it's uh, taking two variables and you see the plus sign in here, so that's a direct C operation. So you can uh, click through the code, uh, see what it gives you, and then take that as a hint uh, where you have to touch your code, where you have to optimize it, uh, what you can change about it. Okay, so executing it, um, all works as reflected. Uh, I'm just getting the, the functions as I would get, uh, get them in Python. I can just call them as they are, and they get the right result. Okay, um, functions. So up to now, I've only defined Python functions. Um, Cython has a couple of more function types because um, when I'm interacting with C code, it's often uh, necessary to um, define uh, C functions directly. Um, and Cython allows you to do that by saying C def uh, in front of function instead of def. And then what you get is 
um, a plain C function, a static C function, which can also pass around into C code as a callback, for example, uh, which is efficiently callable and so on and so forth. So that's, um, it doesn't use Python call semantics anymore. It's not an object, it's just a plain C function. Um, and Python allows you to do that by just, you know, in an exchange in uh, def by C def. Um, okay, a couple more things. Um, so, you can all do all this um, also in, from a Python module. You can just write plain Python code um, instead of writing a uh, Python module. And you can say, I take this function, uh, compile it for me, and then the compilation will actually ha uh, 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 occur at, at import time. It's gonna take the function, uh, analyze the code for you, compile it for you, and replace the function by a compile function. Okay, so it's just, um, it's just a decorator that you can use that is kind of like JIT compilation in the sense that it's still compiling statically, but at import time. Nice feature. Um, okay, how do you interact with C code? So far, you've only seen uh, that you can use uh, C, C data types, C variables in your code. Um, here's uh, uh, an example for uh, using external C code. What I'm doing here is I'm taking the math functions from libc and I'm using them in my, uh, in my code. So I'm taking the sine function, for example, I'm using the declaration for pi, um, dividing pi by two, taking the sine of it and printing it. Okay, and this is often how Cypher code actually looks like. Um, so there's some uh, C code being involved, some Python code, some uh, Python objects being there, and you can really mix them freely as you see fit. Okay, so it's just, you know, use this, use that. It's, it's all there for you at your fingertips. Um, this is how, how um, yeah, memory allocation. Uh, next example, you can use malloc and free uh, in, in Cython. They're just the, the usual, uh, the, the usual uh, libc functions that you can use here. Often people prefer to use um, Python memory allocation instead because then, you know, the Python runtime knows about it, understands it. Uh, so this is how you would do uh, memory allocation in Cypher modules. Uh, and um, yeah, it's, it's just plain C functions. You can use them from your Cypher code. Uh, the nice thing about it is that you can also pass C functions around. You can obviously pass them around into C code, but you can also auto wrap them uh, to pass them into Python. And this is what I'm doing here. I'm taking the math sign function, for example, and just assigning it to a Python variable. And then Cypher goes, okay, that's a C function. Um, in order to turn it into an object, I have to wrap it. So it wraps it for me, um, and then makes it uh, part of my, my module API. Okay, so um, that's, uh, that means that I can now um, call it directly from, uh, from my IPython notebook. Uh, so I can take that function here and call directly into the libc sign function uh, through an object wrapper that Cypher generated for me, but just, you know, doing an assignment, uh, really nice feature. Okay, here's a more involved example. Uh, here's a bit of Lua, uh, um, Lua integration. So Lua is a, is a C implemented runtime, uh, a programming language if you don't know it. Um, and what I'm doing here is uh, I'm taking a piece of code, a piece of Lua code, and uh, here in my Cypher code, I'm, uh, you know, start with a couple of declarations in order to use the uh, Lua C API and then here I'm instantiating Lua runtime, compiling the code I get, uh, calling the code, converting uh, the, the, um, uh, the result argument, um, and then cleaning everything up. One thing you can see here is I'm using try finally. So this is exception based. Whenever something goes wrong, I just raise a Python exception, even though I'm, you know, I'm deeply into calling C code. I can do that at any time, doesn't matter. Um, even if the, the creating the Lua runtime goes wrong, I can just raise a memory error because the usual reason why that would go wrong is, you know, no memory. Um, and uh, that's all I have to do, right? So it's just a couple of functions I can call. I can call dir them directly from my Python code. It, it looks a lot like Python, except that what I'm calling is C code. Um, okay, here's my Lua code. I'm passing it uh, into the function and um, it gives me the right results. This is just a recursive uh, Fibonacci um, calculation here. I can use time to benchmark it. 
uh, it's, well, looks kind of fast enough. Um, okay. Uh, so this is, this is how I can talk to external C libraries. Uh, Cyton has wonderful integration with uh, C data structures, C data types. Um, uh, it makes things a lot easier than if you had, you know, if you were writing all this in, in C. Uh, who of you has been, have been using uh, C before, has been programming in C? Oh, quite a number of people. Do you love it? <laughs> yeah, okay, sounds like sort of. Okay, yep, so it's 10 minutes gone. Uh, so I'll just do a tiny bit more here. Um, so this is how, how uh, Cyton deals with C arrays. Um, uh, you can do slice assignments, you can copy by value, uh, you can loop over them. So it is everything you would expect from Python, uh, just, you know, using uh, C data structures. And so one last thing, uh, using C++, who's been using C++? A bit less than uh, those using C. Um, now C++ uh, has the reputation of being uh, kind of a difficult to use language. Um, uh, it's not from Cython. So if you use it from Cython, it's actually very beautiful because, you know, it's also object oriented. So it feels a lot like Python um, when it's done the right way. Um, so I really recommend uh, using C++ from Cython um, uh, rather than, you know, writing your whole application in C++, which is, uh, which you can do, but I wouldn't recommend that. And uh, this is an example of how you use a, a C++ uh, vector from the standard library. Um, so I'm getting a couple of values in here uh, as a tuple, uh, assigning it to the C++ vector, just to copy it over. Uh, then I can do um, uh, indexing here, normal Python indexing as you would expect. I can iterate over the vector, uh, do int tests, uh, pass the vector into some, some external C++ function and pass it back. Um, and by passing back a vector into, uh, into Python, it basically what it does is it just copies it into you know, the obvious Python representation, which in this case is this. Okay, so it automatically just copies it over so that you can pass it back as, a, as the expected uh, Python result value. And this is how you use it, as in an argument getting the vector list. Okay, so that's like, well, Python in 11 minutes. Okay, uh, finally, finally, we have 15 minutes more to show you how it actually works together. Let's get right into the code. So, first, we just have a little, little helper function that will uh, run something for us with uh, asyncio. We get the instance of the IO loop, we run a coroutine with that IO loop, we return the result using just a helper method. So, to show you that uh, coroutines that uh, will be made with Cyton are totally compatible with uh, ones that you would do in native normal Python. Let, show me you, uh, let, let me show you the following example. So, we use the fancy async dev syntax now, and uh, uh, this is just a very, very basic function that will add one to uh, something, whatever you feed it in. So you give the future in, it will await for that future, it will have result. Then it will say that, uh, it will print that result and just for us leave a remark that this was done with Cyton. And then it will return this result plus one. Then async def one will just return us one, obviously, but we want it to be a coroutine, that's why we define it like this. Uh, showing you that it runs, we generate one, then we add one and then we add one more. This is uh, re uh, the result that we see. We printed one, two, and the output at the end is three. This is Cyton. Uh, the same thing, but uh, now it's done in pure Python. The only difference in the is that I say here Python add so that you see that it's actually run with just Python. Uh, then. You see that here, uh, in this example, what I do is I generate number one, then I use the Python function add one, and then I use the Cyton function function add one, and then I run it all on the IO loop, 
and from prints we also see that the first one was executed with just Python, the second one with Cython, which we could even not notice. So it's totally easy to integrate, it's easy to mix. You can write Cython, then you can write in Python, then you can call it one from another and it still works. Next example, um, just a simple ping pong game. So we will make a, f uh, a function uh, coroutine in uh, Python that will do ping, and then we will do similar in Cython that brings pong. We will call them the Cython version. So we use uh, uh, we do the first definition with Cython. It's uh, decrement by one function. We will have a map of coroutines. Uh, it's just uh, some simple dictionary that will uh, say that. First, we th we have the Cython version. Then, we have a Python version. It's actually a Cython. Yes, uh, we pass this mapping in. Uh, this condition is just not to print too much. So, to switch printing on and off based on the show variable, we print pong if it's a Cython coroutine, and we print ping, ping if it's a Python coroutine. Let me just show you the second one. Then it's easier. Yes. Um, the same thing, but now it prints ping because it's the Python version. The code is simple. You see, we just pick the right uh, coroutine based on the current value and uh, division by two. If it's uh, odd, then we do then we call one coroutine. If it's even, then another one. Here we have the result: ping pong, ping pong, ping pong. Cyton Python, Cyton Python, Cyton Python. Easy. But what for we did this talk? at all is uh, to uh, see if it actually makes sense to mix them, if it gives us any advantage in the speed. So now we will finally time it. Uh, we, we call the same uh, thing. Uh, first, it's just a Python version. We see that uh, the result is 343 MS. Then we call the Cython version. It's 183 MS, which is like double faster with no effort at all. Let me just remind you what is the difference between two, f two functions, Cyton, Python. Difference is just this. And we'd make it double as fast. And then just to have it, the third example is uh, we mix it. So we use uh, for odd numbers Cyton, for event numbers Python. We time it and the result is somewhere in the middle. So it's it's actually not, yeah. It's actually it's actually worse, yes. Let's just run it again. Yeah, you also see that it's light. So now it's sort of in the middle. Now now it's better, yes. Okay. Now I have to run them all. Otherwise you can think that we made it up. Yeah, no, it's fast. It's fast. It, it, it's hell fast. Yeah, yes. Yes, so you see, it's still double faster. It makes sense. If it, all, all you need is just to put percent percent Cyton and you get it double as fast, then it's worth it, I guess. Fizz buzz example. I'm not sure if we have time for that. We do? Okay, then go. Uh, so uh, does everyone know what the fizz buzz gain is? It's actually pretty simple. So um, it's just a, it's kind of a children game that teaches uh, division. Uh, and you, you say number, and if it's divisible by three, you say fizz. If it's divisible by five, you say buzz. And if it's divisible by both, then you say fizz buzz. Okay? So that's what we're implementing here. Um, uh, I have to switch to the right notebook. Um, yeah, here it is. Okay. Um, so what we get in is a stream of numbers. It's actually binary encoded numbers, so four bytes per integer. Um, uh, as a network stream, and so I'm just unpacking those, uh, going through the numbers, uh, collecting my fizz bus uh, values, and then um, actually I'm, I think I'm just printing that or so. Um, okay, so a bit of overhead because I'm, I'm unpacking stuff here. This is a Python implementation of the whole thing, and what you can see down here is I'm running through the values, so I'm using the array object for uh, unpacking everything, running through the values here. Um, Appending fizz buzz fizz or the you know if it's nothing uh, neither fizz nor buzz then I just um, take the, the original integer value and then I have a callback which allows me to pass on the values. Um, here uh, you can see an async for loop. 
um, which uh, you know it, it just continues running whenever there's data. Uh, it's a really nifty feature of the, the new um, 492 pep, um, the new async uh, async await uh, pep. Um, it allows to do data, async data processing using just for loop. Okay, really nice. So um, next thing I'm going to do is I'm taking this code verbatimly, copying it into, into a Python uh, into a Cypher cell. So that was Python code. Just taking it there, renaming it to you know have two functions. Um, so I just run the Python version, run the Cypher version, get it compiled, um, and then I'm setting up my my data stream here. It's just kind of a fake data stream that chunks a uh, long long uh, integer stream into chunks so that I can do. Um, you know, looped processing, um, running that. Uh, here I'm building my data stream. This is what I'm expecting for the first 18 values. One, two, and then there's fizz, buzz, and so on. Um, and uh, here's uh, just to show you that it works. Um, works in both versions. Um, and then here's a, a, com um, a performance comparison between the two. Uh, I'm calling the Cypher function, calling the Python function. And you can see what the performance difference is. Uh, where is it? Here. Okay, it's still running. Yep, so the Cypher ver uh, version runs in seven milliseconds. Uh, Path version takes twice as long. And then, depending on the chunk size, uh, the timings differ. But it's usually something like twice as fast just by compiling it. Okay? Um, then the next thing I did was I rewrote the whole thing in a more um, you know C-ish way. Um, I'm iterating. Uh, I'm running through just the, the data buffer at a you know C character level uh, here. I'm doing the same thing in a more C-ish way by just casting uh, you know four bytes to an integer, which is faster than uh, doing the the array the Python array conversion. Um, yeah, so that speeds it up. And when I run that thing, uh, then what I get in comparison is it's another, I think it's another 40 times, 40% uh, faster here. Okay, in comparison. So what I gain overall is um, uh, close to three times faster uh, for the, the end version. Okay. Yep, and then we're through with the talk. I think that it's a good time for questions. Uh, we'll pass the microphones to questions if anyone wants. Um, no, don't run. <laughs> <laughs> so does anyone have any? I see a question down there. Um, and we've probably got time for a couple of questions even. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I was just wondering if you're using this at work and what you're doing with it. Hmm? Sorry, what? If you're doing this technique at work and what you're actually doing with it. You mean the using Cyton together with AsyncIO? Exactly. Oh, we are using AsyncIO there. We did not compile, I think, yet uh, Cyton no. pieces there, but uh, we played with it to make this talk. And it works. That was more the, uh, the idea of the talk, right? To, to convey that you know speed is important when it matters. You can use Cypher for it. Thanks. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Question. Am I right in thinking that this also works with Python 2.7? I mm -hmm. mean, if you use Cyton. Yeah. Uh, so the problem is um, the uh, the async def syntax was only added uh, in, in Python 3.5. Um, so it won't work with Python code, but in, inside of Python, it actually works. Yeah, that's the ma major selling point for me. <laughs> Maybe you didn't uh, <laughs> yeah. show this. Yeah. So just one more question. Um, can you tell me about NumPy integration? Um, can I use this to cast the NumPy arrays? How, how well does that work with Cython? Um, so uh, the question was uh, how well NumPy is integrated with Cython. Extremely well. Uh, like everyone uses it. Um, for, uh, I said, Cython is, is used a lot in scientific Python. 
um, and we have special syntax in Cython that allows you to say uh, this is a, a, a you know, data buffer, this is how it looks like, and then you can just iterate over it, run through it uh, as fast as your processor can, and so it's, yeah, it's one of the main use cases for Cython, yes. All right, uh, are these uh, async IO features in Cython already ready for production, or is it like experimental features like in uh, beta or something? Uh, so the async, uh, async await support in Cython was developed at the same time as the Python support for async and await. Um, there were a couple of changes recently which we followed, uh, but they're at, at the same level now. So um, they work equally well. And the fun thing is they actually influence each other. So um, while the Python support was de being developed, we developed our Python support. And so we had an impact on, on how they did it and they uh, changed how we did it. And, and so like both um, uh, improved uh, by, by working together. I have a little final note that uh, if you have uh, any interest in getting more into detail of Cython or, or of Asynca separately, you are very welcome to the trainings that are tomorrow and the day after tomorrow that will cover these two topics really in detail. Um, all right, I think we got time for one last question. Uh, thanks, um, thanks for the talk. Uh, I was just wondering if, um, if Siphon could take advantage of the uh, Python 3 type hints in order to compile yeah, so that's a big topic. We were actually, uh, so I discussed that with um, uh, Guido a couple of times, and the intention of the Python type hints is not really something that's meant for steady compilation, and it doesn't really help us. Uh, so it's, it's meant for type checking, for annotating uh, APIs, for making them machine understandable, basically, but it does not help in compilation, and that's why we're not currently using, making any use of it. Thank you very much. That's the last of the questions. Thank you, guys. Thanks for attending.